Hi, I'm Kathleen Graber, and I am the author of The Eternal City. It's a collection of poems, and I'm going to read a couple of poems to you. To introduce the poems, I can say that the Eternal City is Rome, um, and the idea for the book, or at least for that part of the book, came to me after reading an essay by Joseph Brodsky about Marcus Aurelius. And so the center of the book has a, a little series of poems that all take epigraphs from uh, Marcus Aurelius' Meditation. And this is uh, book eight, um, so it's one of those, and it has an epigraph from Aurelius. Remember that it is a shame to be surprised if the fig tree produces figs. So it is to be surprised if the world produces such and such things of which it is productive. For the physician and the helmsman, it is a shame to be surprised if a man has a fever or if the wind is unfavorable. In order that the world may be ever new, my brother and his wife are going to have a baby. Earlier this month, they heard the tiny heart out of the whirl of the mother's organs, suddenly a galloping. Celerity, hooves. And yesterday they saw their child somersaulting in the unlit paddock of the womb. It turns its animal face to the camera it cannot possibly imagine, raises its arm as if to wave. Gibbon traces the beginning of the end to Aurelius's brutal son. Aurelius, who turned his back on the blood of the Colosseum, has sired the Secutor who straps tight his helmet and buckler to kill naked, unarmed men before the crowd. The rarest creatures are released into the amphitheater, the speedy ostrich, the panther, and one giraffe, the most gentle of the large quadrupeds for him to slay. Today, my friend just in the door from teaching Lear to college freshmen phones from across the country he too is going to be a dad. He's known for months, but was afraid to say, what if something had gone wrong? These sons are noble sons, and their sons will be as well. It is a shame to be surprised if it has been, after all, a good thing to have been born. We bow our heads, not for fear of what they will become, but for fear of fever, the crescent pointed arrow of simply being flesh, the tender arena within which there is already nothing they can do. And the second poem I'm going to read um, is not wholly unrelated uh, in that the baby was born, and it's my nephew, and his name is Levi, and his newborn self features a little bit in this poem, which is called Dead Man, and it has uh, it takes its title from the Jim Jarmusch film of the same name, um, and it has an epigraph from William Blake, which is fitting if you've seen the film, as Johnny Depp plays a character named William Blake, but it's not that William Blake. Some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. We spend our lives trying to grasp the premise. William Blake is not, for instance, William Blake, but rather a 19th century accountant from Cleveland on the lamb for murder and the theft of a horse. In the closing scene, he is going to die, and so is nobody, his half-blackfoot, half-blood guide. Sure, this is a Western, a morality tale about a destiny made manifest through the voice of a gun, and a hero whose mythic flight from innocence destroys him. But we all come to the end of the line soon enough, the obvious just seems wiser when nobody says it. Time, it turns out, is the most common noun in the English language, as if by constant invocation we could keep it at bay. Yesterday, I sat in another state on a large rubber ball in my brother's basement, bouncing my newborn nephew in my arms. His mother, on the phone with a friend, asks what we should fear more, the hobo spider, or the poison that kills it. I want to whisper into his ear something that feels like knowledge. Once upon a time, there was nothing, and one day there will be nothing again. This is the faraway place 
to which his tiny weight calls me. If he could understand the words, I think, he would know what I mean, having only just sprung himself from that fine sea. Sometimes we coo to soothe him. Don't cry, little bird. I know, I know. But only the roar of the vacuum finally calms him. For nothing sounds as much like the lost world of the womb as the motors of our machines. The root of travel means torture, having passed from medieval Latin into old French. As the action opens, Johnny Depp, shot in black and white, is already rocking into night on a train. And soon he will begin his dying. This is not to say that the inky band fanning across the morning blue of a kestrel's tail feathers has no meaning, or the first fingers of rust coming into bloom on the green enamel chassis of a corona typewriter left out in the rain. Direct observation, the naturalist Nico Timbergen assures us, is the only real thing. Perhaps this is what I should tell him, or that this moment, too, is a part of some migration. Every snow bunting composes its own song, and a careful watcher can tell one kitty wake from its neighbor by the little dots on the tips of its wings. The most used verb is also the most humble, merely to be. Nobody can teach to William Blake the auguries of William Blake. We are instead our own Vatic visions, bumbling prophets, our sense of ourselves as invented as film. Later, in an ocean-going canoe lined with cedar boughs, he will drift out into cold breakers, two bullets in his chest. But here, in his small hat and wire glasses, he still seems sweetly comic. He holds up a letter. Someone's promised him a job. His fancy plaid suit makes him look like a clown. So the Eternal City is, uh, has a very exciting role to play in that it's the first book coming out in the newly relaunched Princeton Contemporary Poets series. And it will be joined uh, in the next year by two other books, by Troy Jallamore and Anthony Corelli. And I'm really pleased uh, that the Eternal City is a part of that series. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, Marcus Aurelius and, and uh, how you came to this attraction. Sure. Um, well, I, it was a very, very hot summer. It was uh, July. And it was too hot to do very much of anything. And so I was looking for something to read. And I happened to read an essay by Joseph Brodsky about Aurelius. And uh, it was very, very captivating. The thing that um, interested me most about Aurelius is um, that he was a Stoic, and therefore was not um, attached too much to the things of this world. And I have a problem with things. So I'm a bit of a junk collector. And so I decided that um, my project would be to clean out my garage, and that I would use Marcus Aurelius as a um, assistant meaning that he would sort of encourage me to uh, give away the things I really didn't need. And so I would um, go down to the garage and clean a little bit, and then I would come upstairs and read a little Marcus Aurelius, and then I would go back down to the garage, fully inspired, and get rid of some more stuff. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that, I would try to write one poem uh, every day for the activity. Mm -hmm. So one meditation, some garage cleaning, one poem. And were you able to get rid of get rid of the stuff that was in the basement? I think I got rid of a lot of the stuff that was in there, yeah. But, you know, it's, um, the problem is that it, it, it somehow comes back. Like, you get rid of it and then it recollects. But I, I, I've made a lot of progress. Well, I think we're happy that it recollects, though, because it results in more poems. It might be a metaphor. The, 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 be yeah, thing. see, I thought, I thought the eternal city was a metaphor for the mind, but maybe the really junk the junk heap <laughs> might be a much more effective metaphor for the mind. Could be. It's certainly my mind, anyway. It could be. And um, you are from uh, an unusual landscape. You grew up in a rather unusual landscape. Can you talk about that? That is landscape? true. Um, 
I grew up in Wildwood, New Jersey, which New Jersey doesn't seem like an unusual landscape to people who are only familiar with northern New Jersey. But Wildwood is in southern New Jersey. Um, and southern New Jersey, the principal um, industries are agriculture and tourism. And so Wildwood is a beach town. And it's a very honky-tonk beach town. And so I've spent all of my life on the boardwalk in, in Wildwood um, with games. My parents had games of chance. and. My husband and I, for a long time, had a music business, a record shop on the boardwalk there. Which appears, I believe, in one of the... Uh, it the does. It's in, the, it's in uh, book three. I mean, we've only are just in the process of, of um, selling the business, so we've had it for 25 years. And so when I was writing those poems, I was still, you know, clean the garage, write a poem, go in and sell Metallica t-shirts at night. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's my life.